All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with our monthly Future of Freedom Foundation webinar with Sheldon Richmond. Uh, this week we'll be talking about the decline of political satire in America and uh, John Stewart in particular. Sheldon Richmond, if you don't know, is the vice president of the Future of Freedom Foundation and the editor of their monthly journal, Future of Freedom. For 15 years, he was the editor of The Freeman, uh, published by the Foundation for Economic Education. And he's the author of several books, including Separating School and State, How to Liberate America's Families, and Your Money or Your Life, Why We Must Abolish the Income Tax. Uh, he's been widely published everywhere. He's an expert on just about everything, and he's a wonderful teacher. So without further ado, turn it over to him, Sheldon Richmond. I try to be an expert on knowing what I don't know. <clears throat> so, uh, but thank you for that introduction. Uh, as I usually like to say, being the argumentative purpose, uh, person on that I am, I, I think I should take time to rebut the introduction, but since time is scarce, I won't. <clears throat> well, this, this is a fun topic, I think. Uh, sad, but at the same time fun. So I hope, I hope it'll lead to some uh, a good discussion. Uh, everybody probably by now is aware of the... Uh, the flap involving John Stewart and Election Day. Uh, so I want to talk about that, and I want to draw some other stories into it that have been go uh, going on lately, uh, in particular the Jonathan Gruber story, which uh, I'm sure everybody now knows about. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit and remind everybody what, what, what happened there. It involves the passage of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. But a little background, uh, let's talk a little bit of background before we get into America's civic religion and John Stewart. Uh, I wanna say a little bit about political satire. Uh, as I think most people know, it has a long and honorable history. Uh, we can name a lot of names. I'm sure I'd leave some, uh, I'll leave some important people out. I, uh, since the, my article was published a couple of weeks ago, I've, I've gone back and actually added names because I felt like I've sl I slighted people. But obviously, it, it would be an endless list. But it includes, I mean, you go back to the Greeks, Aristophanes, and then uh, I jumped to Shakespeare and Jonathan Swift and W.S. Gilbert, uh, Mark Twain, George Orwell, Lenny Bruce, Dick Gregory, Tom Lehrer, uh, who, along with David Frost, uh, was, uh, was uh, responsible for a great series in the 1960s called That Was the Week That Was. Uh, most of you are probably too young to remember that. Uh, George Carlin, of course, there was a British uh, series called Spit and Image in the 80s that ran on, on American television that involved uh, caricature puppets of, uh, of uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, Margaret Thatcher and the, the other political uh, uh, principles of the day. Very good fighting satire. Uh, another British uh, uh, series called Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. You can find those online. Uh, and I advise you to take a look at them. They're hilarious, really well done, making fun of the British government. Uh, I would add the Smothers Brothers, the early Saturday Night Live, uh, Dave Barry, my old friend Dave Barry, The Onion, South Park, Family Guy on some, some episodes, and, and so many more. So it, it, there's a great tradition of political satire, poking fun, but in a deep way, at the political system in order to ridicule it. Uh, unfortunately, while it would be a slight exaggeration to say that political satire is dead in America, it, I believe it's been on the critical list for some time. And that's too bad because we really, really could use it now. Now, throughout history, satirists uh, have risked their liberty and even their lives to use humor to engage in deep commentary about the reigning political system and its exalted uh, political figures, uh, the people who called themselves leaders, but I think are surely uh, better described as rulers and misleaders. But no satirist risks uh, his life or liberty in America today. It's a perfectly safe environment for uh, making fun of the government. Uh, I mean, they, they do drone some, they've droned some American citizens in, uh, outside of the country and they've arrested people, but so far no, haven't arrested anybody for satire that I can uh, recall uh, in, recently. Uh, it was worse in some respects some years ago. Uh, Lenny Bruce was harassed by the police. Uh, the excuse they used was his drug use, but I think also uh, he was such a good satirist, may, may, making so uh, slashing uh, fun of the uh, of the political system uh, that uh, I have a feeling that was one of the reasons the police uh, harassed him constantly. Uh, 
so this lack of risk uh, is one of the things that makes it so puzzling that's that good scarcity a good uh, satire is so scarce uh, uh you know is it fear that keeps uh, satire, uh, satire in, in a you know safely uh, confined or is it simply that so few people today can see the fundamental flaws in the american political system <clears throat> which trashes liberty in so many ways so let's talk about john stewart <clears throat> And the, the host of the Daily Show. Now he's probably regarded as America's premier political satirist, which I think is kind of ironic, given what the, the story, uh, <clears throat> given the fact that he felt it was necessary to recant after apparently uttering a heresy, according to uh, America's uh, civil uh, religion, namely democracy. In an election day interview with uh, CNN, CNN's Christian Amanpour. Uh, after being asked whether he had voted that day, he said no, uh, to which Amanpour reacted with uh, probably feigned amazement. No, she said no. And he continued, I just moved. I don't even know where my thing is now. So that was discussed on CNN as if it was some kind of scandal. Uh, and that night on his own show, Stewart uh, felt that he had to reassure the audience uh, about this. So first he cracked the joke about uh, uh, assuring them that uh, he's actually known where his thing is since age 13. So he had to, you know, make a bit of a risque uh, uh, crack there. But then he acknowledged that his uh, his answer to Alampur earlier, earlier in the day had, com had uh, created, quote, a bit of a story. So he's right. It was a bit of a storm, actually. So he went on to say, to quote, to set the record straight, I did vote today. I was being flip and it kind of took off. I shouldn't have been flip about that. It sent a message that I didn't think voting was important or that I didn't think it was a big issue. And I do. And I did vote. I was being flip and I shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. So I apologize. Uh, now, where to begin in uh, dealing with this? Uh, first off, how did this flip answer, uh, assuming it, it was flip in the first place, uh, create a bit of a story? I mean, he's a comedian after all. Several nights a week, he makes fun of politicians, I would say at a fairly superficial level, and government bungling. He does flip for a living. So who got upset with his reply, aside from perhaps uh, Amanpour? Whether one believes Stewart's answer or not, how in the world was it the stuff of public controversy? I mean, this is really baffling when you think about it. Uh, does no one have a sense of humor in the United States? Uh, must he say just kidding after every sentence? Uh, should his producers put at the bottom of the screen J slash K every time he says something just so no one uh, will be make a mistake and uh, realize that uh, he, he's joking about everything? You know, maybe one uh, reason political satire is so scarce is that Americans don't get it. They just don't understand it. Uh, Paul Fussell, who wrote uh, excellent books on how war degrades culture, said that World War II killed American sense of irony. Just thought that that disappeared from the culture. Uh, he writes about this in his book, Wartime, which is a very good book, and I recommend it if you're interested in, in, in uh, the impact of, uh, of war, those war, World War I and II in particular, uh, on, on American culture. Check out uh, Fussell's books on, the, the, on those subjects. So Stewart furnishes some excellent evidence of Fussell's claim that Americans just don't understand satire or irony. But even allowing for the irony impairment of American culture, did Stewart really feel he had to apologize? Uh, did he think he'd lose his audience if he became known as one who was flip about the holy right of voting? Uh, I realize that ratings are a matter of life and death, but come on. I doubt that his career was in jeopardy. He might have even uh, picked up a few uh, voters. By the way, I don't really think it was even a flip remark. All he said was, I don't I don't know where the polls are in my new neighborhood. Uh, that's hardly flip. It's it, it might on you know, it's it, it's actually a, a reason some might someone might have for not not voting if they're moving. So it, it doesn't constitute a flip remark at all. <clears throat> uh, but uh, so that's one interpretation that uh, that you know that he was uh, afraid of the uh, the ramifications of being known as somebody who was, took voting casually. Uh, 
Uh, but there's another view, which was uh, actually uh, voiced by my son, uh, Ben Richman, who, uh, by the way, uh, has a keen eye for politics, but also is a very good rock guitarist. I'll put in a plug for his band, The Revolutioners. Um, but he wrote on Facebook, I don't think he was giving it into public pressure either. I, I think he genuinely felt that joking about it, namely voting, was wrong. At the end of the day, Stuart loves the system, he says. So I think that's I think that's right. Uh, after all, Stuart favors a mandatory national service. In an interview recently, he said, quote, there should be a draft where every young person has to do one year of something, military, public works, something so that we all feel invested in the same game, because that's the part that we've lost. Well, if we all want to be invested in the same game, you know, why didn't he include uh, you know, comedians in, the, in, the, in this draft of any age. I mean, after all, we're all going to be invested in the same game. I don't understand the arbitrary uh, uh, age uh, limit that he wants to put on this for, for young people. It seems a little bit hypocritical to me. Uh, I will concede that Stewart can be funny at times uh, when he pokes fun at politicians for their gaffes and indiscretions, uh, although I, I do think it's at a fairly superficial level. Uh, okay, uh, and I, and I like a distinction that uh, my colleague at the uh, uh, Center for Stateless Society, uh, Ryan Calhoun, pointed out, and I recommend uh, the article he did about John Stewart at uh, c4ss.org, where he uh, he contrasted the a, a true comedian with what he calls a fool, and uh, uh, or name another word for a, a court jester. And he discusses what the role of a court jester was in previous uh, you know previous eras. This was someone who could who could come to the to the to the court before the king and the queen and and make fun uh, of them and of the regime and uh, they would laugh the courtiers uh, courtiers would all laugh and uh, as long as he didn't uh, venture over some line which could be invisible or very fine um, he was perfectly safe it was and it was considered okay people could let off steam and laugh a little bit. But he was in, uh, always in danger of if he stepped uh, over the over the line, if he said something that he shouldn't uh, say, uh, he could be in big trouble. And uh, Calhoun's point is that um, while uh, uh, Stewart's hero, or, you know, claimed hero, uh, George Carlin was a comedian or satirist in the best tradition of the, that word, uh, Stewart, in fact, is a court jester or a fool. He's the guy standing there wearing the funny hat with the bells on holding the, uh, the little uh, thing with the bells on it, and, you know, shaking it after making a funny line that everyone's supposed to laugh at. Uh, but he backs away. Uh, uh, you know, occasionally he's, he's ventured into a minefield. Uh, he, he's actually done, he's actually surprised me once, once or twice in talking about the Middle East and uh, Israel. Uh, but if you watch closely, you'll see that he doesn't plunge the dagger in too deep. Uh, he is a man of the system, a progressive. Uh, he believes government is good. The more active, the better. He really gets down to fundamentals, and on, on the rare occasion when he does, he quickly retreats. He's hardly the type who would unmask American civic religion, uh, democracy, and really make fun of it, because you can see how he acted when he just made that fairly harmless remark. This religion is sacred, and apparently he has no problem with that. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand that democracy rests on some flawed premises, uh, two of which are every vote counts. I mean, you, ju you just can't go on TV and say, you know, no, no one vote counts. When they tell you your vote counts, to make sure you get out and vote. That's a, a lot of nonsense. You're not going to see anybody say that on television. Uh, certainly not anybody who's got a regular show. And we don't we wouldn't expect it from uh, John Stewart. Uh, and the second uh, premise is that, uh, you know, the educated voter is some sort of a practicable uh, uh, ideal. In other words, that there can be truly an educated voter. Of course, in a system like the US system where government has its hands in everything, it's impossible to be an educated voter. You have to be an expert in economics and a whole lot of other uh, subjects. You'd have to know a lot of history to be able to judge what candidates promise uh, promise to do. Because how, how can you uh, otherwise uh, uh, judge uh, uh, such a thing? And uh, of course, given the fact that your own vote doesn't count in any sizable jurisdiction, uh, why would you invest any time to gain the knowledge and understanding that's required to judge the uh, pronouncements of the politicians? So, there, so there's bad incentives and there's, there's this impossible 
uh, objective of being a truly educated voter who, uh, you know, who's reading the federal budget, understands the federal budget, and its government is so opaque and so complex and so involved in so many things that it, it would just be impossible to be uh, uh, someone who was up on every issue and could judge uh, candidates. Uh, you'd also have to study political philosophy and, and, and on and on and on. Uh, on this point about one vote's not, not counting, this is just simple arithmetic. I know some people get offended by this. I presume this crowd here won't, but, um, uh, but, I, but I've talked about this many times before, and people will get outright mad at you if you suggest that their vote doesn't count. But it's just math, okay? It's one, any sizable jurisdiction, your vote is like a drop uh, in the ocean. Uh, and it's not going to make a difference. In fact, Gordon Tullock, great economist, great uh, person, a great theorist who showed uh, uh, had a great theory of government failure, one of the founders of the Public Choice School, unfortunately, uh, who just died a couple of weeks ago. He said you, uh, you have a better chance of being killed on the way to the polls than of, uh, affecting the outcome uh, of an election. So at this point, let me bring in the Jonathan Gruber story because it, it dovetails so well. Jonathan Gruber is a... Uh, MIT professor is considered an expert in health policy, helped to uh, uh, devise uh, 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 Mitt Romney's uh, health care uh, plan in uh, Massachusetts when Romney was governor, and then was a very uh, significant consultant and highly paid, apparently got something like $6 million over the years. He's gotten $6 million from different government agencies, uh, uh, being a consultant and writing reports. He was involved in uh, the... Uh, architecture of the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, very important person, recently caught on the video saying that Obamacare passed uh, because of the stupidity of the American voter and the lack of transparency about how it would be funded. And of course, this, this now, uh, this is the classic definition of a gaffe, right? It's when you say something that uh, is, either, is either true or something you really believe, but it's impolitic to say it publicly. That's the definition of a gaffe. And so that's what happened here. Uh, here's one of the elite saying, we only passed this thing because American voters are stupid and the, and the process is not uh, is so uh, untransparent that uh, you know nobody outside could have figured out what was going on. Of course, uh, the Obama and Nancy Pelosi and all the people who are involved in getting this bill passed are running around now with their hair on fire. For the first, the first tactic was to say, we don't even know who this guy Gruber is. And that fell away because of, there's there's ample uh, evidence that Gruber was a close uh, confidant of Obama. Uh, Obama cited him. Uh, Nancy Pelosi cited him. Everybody knew who he was, but they acted like they never heard of the guy. They said, "I don't even know the guy." Uh, so that that uh, that fell apart. And then they just called him stupid for saying that the American voter is stupid. Uh, the issue actually is not stupidity. I mean, Gruber. Uh, uh, should have picked another word if he was going to really be honest. It's not a matter of stupidity. It's a matter of in, lack of incentives to become educated and the fact that the government is very, very good at uh, at uh, creating opaqueness so, so that you can't penetrate the veil and see what is exactly going on. Um, there's a great book on this subject by Charlotte Twight that I'd like to recommend called uh, um, um, Dependent on D.C., and she has a marvelous theory of how government raises the political transaction costs so that it's very difficult for you know, the average uh, person who's busy uh, making a living and raising a family to, number one, figure out what the government is doing, and number two, uh, reacting to it uh, in some effective way if the person happens to figure out what the government is doing. So you got these two barriers, two, two uh, uh, barriers to understanding and change. Uh, and that's why she calls those political uh, transaction costs. Uh, number one, the government can make sure you don't know what's going on. And, and, you know, like I said, try reading the federal budget sometime or any any bill. Don't forget, Obamacare was 2,200 pages. And um, and uh, and even that understates how uh, opaque it was because so many of those pages were not what the Obamacare was going to mean, but was uh, directions to the Department of Health and Human Services or, or other agencies to write rules about particular things. So in other words, the rules themselves were not passed by members of Congress. It was just authorization for, for executive agencies 
to write the rules. So if you read the bill, if you read the 2,200 uh, pages uh, in their entirety and paid good attention and really absorbed it, you still wouldn't know what the bill was going to mean once it was passed, which is why Nancy Pelosi said back during the days it was being uh, debated, you won't, you, we won't know what's in it until it's passed. Now, it's really funny for her to be denouncing Gruber for saying what he said when she herself said, we won't know what's in the bill until it's passed. In other words, it is transparent and the American people have, can't know. But the only thing I would correct is that it's not a matter of stupidity. Anyway, I think this ties in with the, with the, the John Stewart point. Because, you know, he doesn't want to make fun of voting, but look what a joke voting and the results of voting are. Uh, and yet, you know, his very minor act of humor, uh, he had to apologize for. Uh, let's go a little deeper in Stewart's background. Uh, it was only in 2009 when, uh, uh, when uh, he uh, called Harry Truman a war criminal during a conversation with um, a noted uh, neoconservative. And uh, the reason he called him a war criminal is uh, obviously the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, toward the end of World War II in 1945. Now, that statement was actually not satirical or, or ironic or flip. It was just the unvarnished truth. Truman's victims threatened no one. They, these were uh, civilians, Japanese civilians. The war was essentially over. Yet those civilians were subjected to the most ghastly fates. Some were vaporized on the spot, literally leaving only their shadows behind. I'm not exaggerating here. And don't forget that Truman dropped the second bomb three days later. So one bomb wasn't enough. And he considered dropping a third, but he decided at that point that he didn't want to kill any more children. So uh, reading about uh, what the victims experienced uh, is sure to turn your stomach. But nevertheless, Stewart recanted a couple of days later on his program. He said, quote, the other night I may have mentioned or I may have like we said, I may have mentioned during the discussion we were having that Harry Truman was a war criminal. And after saying it, I thought to myself, that was dumb. And it was dumb, stupid, in fact. So I shouldn't have said that. I, and I did. So I say now, no, I don't believe that to be the case. The atomic no. bomb a very complicated decision in the context of the horrific war. Uh, and I walk that back because it, it was, in my estimation, a stupid thing to say. Sorry, close quote. Stewart did not explain or bother to explain why the statement was stupid. He likes that word, apparently. His, he called his voting remarks stupid. Or why Truman's decision was complicated. That's what every Truman apologist says. He didn't elaborate. What was complicated? What was complicated about it? But we know what Stuart meant. In America's civic religion, it is heresy to talk about an American war as though it was a massive series of crimes committed by our leaders. You must not say that. Actually, that's not it. You must not think that. Two and two is five. Never forget it. Yes, it is permissible to say that the war in Vietnam, never World War II, however, was a blunder colossal mistake, but don't say it was mass murder and a humongous criminal operation. Don't say the perpetrators should be brought to justice. Noam Chomsky did that and was thenceforth barred from publications that had regularly published him, like the New York Review of Books. It is a rare mainstream publication that would let you say that Bush 43, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Powell, Rice, Tenet, Petraeus, McChrystal, Ed Isle, should be hold before the International Criminal Court to stand trial for their wars of aggression against the people of Iraq and Afghanistan. Has Nuremberg been erased from the history books? I should also point out that, uh, should point out Stewart's fawning obsequiousness before court historians like Doris Kearns Goodwin and courtiers like former Secretaries of State Madeleine Albright, Hillary Clinton, and Henry Kissinger. You can look those up. Google Google John Stewart, any one of those names, and watch the videos. See how he treats these former secretaries of state. Uh, every time they publish a book, he brings them on and fawns over them. He had Kissinger on uh, a couple of years ago. Kissinger had a book out, and he just greeted him by saying, doctor, 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 please sit down. And it was, uh, it was disgusting, actually. It was rather sickening. 
Uh, so getting back to, uh, by the way, regarding uh, fawning about uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Hillary uh, Clinton, who uh, is a presumptive uh, presidential aspirant, is uh, reviewed over the last weekend, reviewed in the Washington Post, Henry Kissinger's latest book called World Order. I recommend it to you to, to see what Hillary uh, Hillary thinks of the Henry Kissinger. It's going to be the subject of my op-ed tomorrow, so you might want to watch for that at fff.org. Uh, getting back to Stewart and voting, his remark was actually pretty lame. I think I've said some of this before. All he said was he was that he uh, couldn't vote because he didn't know where the polls were. Uh, <clears throat> he didn't say he was happy about that. Uh, here's what he could have said. Did I vote? Of course I voted. Would I pass up a critical opportunity to add my one single drop of water to the vast ocean? Why, every vote counts. Had I stayed home, the whole country, heck, the whole world might be different. You must be crazy to think I'd let that happen. That would have been satire, but it also would have struck too deep at America's civic religion, which holds that trudging faithfully to the polls every few years is the be all and end all of freedom. That voting majorities by nature must violate the rights of voting minorities and non-voters is curiously overlooked. In fact, you better not say that. In fact, I always like to say in democracy, the majority rules and the rights of the minority are protected. I submit that that's a, those two things can't both be true. Okay, pick your pick which one you want, but they both can't be true. What I wouldn't give to see Americans' uh, reaction, the looks on their faces, to Emma Goldman saying on television, if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal. Excuse me, but I grew up watching George Carlin, supposedly uh, uh, Stewart's hero. So call me spoiled. But George, but John Stewart is the George Carlin, what Joe, Joe Scarborough is the H.L. Mencken. Here's how Carlin handled politics. Quote, I don't vote. On election day, I stay home. I firmly believe that if you vote, you have no right to complain. Now, some people like to twist that around. They say, if you don't vote, you, if you don't vote, you have no right to complain. But where's the logic in that? If you vote and you elect dishonest and competent politicians, uh, and they get into office and screw everything up, you are responsible for what they've done. You voted it, You voted uh, them in. You caused the problem. You have no right to complain. I, on the other hand, who did not vote, who did not, did not even leave the House on Election Day, am in no way responsible for what these politicians have done and have every right to complain about the mess uh, that you created. Now, can you uh, imagine, uh, any of you who uh, are George Carlin fans, uh, imagine him ever apologizing for such a statement. The very thought is, uh, is uh, I mean, it's unthinkable. You can't really form the thought. So I leave, I leave you on this note. George, where are you? We need you. I will uh, stop there and uh, throw things out for uh, conversation and uh, questions. And uh, let's have a good discussion about this. All right, if you have questions, you can ask them in the little Q&A box in the upper right. Um, you know, I, in thinking about, you know, John Stewart in, in particular coming up to this event, you know, John Stewart, I, I enjoy his comedy. I watch occasionally, not that I have a whole lot of time for TV, but anytime it gets to a serious issue where he has a chance to actually bite at at the administration i've always been disappointed and it, it's hard like i i don't want to say i don't like john stewart because i i still do like john stewart but he's he's stuck in this uh he's stuck in a system and in a mindset that so many people are stuck in uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can break people out of that mindset uh, not particular. I don't know what would happen if one of us had a one-to-one -one conversation with John Stewart. I mean, I think John Stewart is a, uh, you know, probably a Democrat, probably considers himself a good liberal or progressive. So he's, he's wedded to the system. Uh, I don't know if he's ever encountered radical analysis, uh, of any kind. Uh, you know, I assume, uh, as a younger man in college, perhaps he did, and maybe flirted with, uh, uh, you know, what we think of as left-wing radicalism, not libertarianism. I don't know what he thinks of libertarianism. Uh, I guess he's had Ron Paul on, uh, but I'm not sure what the, you know, those interviews, he's often just going for laughs and you can't really, 
really tell. But I, I assume he thinks, you know, activist government is, is compassionate, humane, and uh, anybody who doesn't favor that is, uh, is callous and, uh, you know, doesn't care about the poor and the sick. Uh, and so th I think a, a lot of libertarian thinking would be foreign to him. I don't think he uh, would understand it. Uh, there's someone named John Stewart here on the uh, attendance list, so maybe he maybe he can speak for himself. <laughs> maybe he's in the crowd. I'm flattered <laughs> if he's attending. <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, we have an imposter among us. Um, I, I talked to uh, Judge Napolitano after his second appearance on The Daily Show, and he yeah. said he, he really thinks that John Stewart is a fellow traveler, but he seems to even even more just recently be going down a slightly different road so you know who knows well apart from the content of of his uh you know his own views there's something very uh uh paradoxical paradoxical about someone who regards himself as a a, a social comedian you know and a satirist who apologizes when I go back to what I was saying at the end, who could imagine George Carlin apologizing for anything he said? Uh, and now George Carlin thought out what he said. I don't think he spoke uh, impulsively. I mean, I think he put a, a lot of care and time into what he was going to say, and he was speaking uh, what he believed. Um, I can't imagine any kind of outcry forcing him and saying, hey, I'm sorry, I really shouldn't have joked about that. Nobody can imagine George Carlin doing that. So for 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 uh, Stewart to first of all claim that he idolizes uh, Carlin, and second to to hold himself out as some sort of biting commentator on the on the political scene, and yet fawning over the people I mentioned, and then uh, in these uh, very uh, significant cases, uh, backing away and apologizing just makes no sense at all. I don't get him. So I'll leave it at that. Our first question is from Joseph. He asks, I would like to ask, what happened to Bill Maher? I remember hearing he was a libertarian at one point. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not a Bill Maher expert. I, he annoys the hell out of me. I know he did used to call himself a libertarian. I think there were times when people thought libertarianism was a sexy word. Bill, look, Bill Buckley at times called himself a libertarian. One of his later books uh, uh, had that as a subtitle. And I wondered, I asked somebody uh, who knew him, uh, why would he do that? Why would he, why would he use the word libertarian? And, and the answer was, because it sounds sexy. Um, so that's the only thing I can explain. I, I don't really, I can't recall ever hearing uh, Bill Maher say anything of a libertarian nature. Now, like I said, I, I don't know the whole of his work, or maybe somebody can point something out. And I guess it's not, it wouldn't, I guess somewhere along the lines, he said something consistent with libertarianism. But the little I know of him, uh, and uh, you know, I see clips of his now and then. I don't. He, there's another one I don't get. What kind of satirist is he? He's he just sounds to me like he's an Obama guy. Uh, he sits around with what Rachel Maddow around his circle in his show and denies that the Palestinians are even occupied by the Israelis. They can't even bring themselves to say that. So you know, that's satire. That's that's making fun of. Uh, politicians and, and power they don't speak truth to power i uh we had uh andrew heaton on the other night uh he's a libertarian comedian he was talking about uh the difference between someone like john stewart and someone like bill maher bill maher doesn't really go for laugh lines he goes for things that everybody in his audience already agrees with and fundamentally he's pretty much a, a democrat who likes to smoke pot and if he wants to call that libertarian, then fine. But the purpose of words is communication. If you're using words so far removed from what they mean to many people, then you're not really communicating well. And, I mean, you do have the, the instances, like, with his uh, statements on Palestine that just make it abundantly clear. Although, on the other hand, he did, uh, when he had Rand Paul on the other night, apparently he was uh, somewhat nice to Rand Paul. We can uh, maybe debate about whether that is uh, at all libertarian anyway, but, you know. Uh, our next question is from Lucky Pirate. Uh, when he, I think we're talking about Jon Stewart here, 
had Peter Schiff on the air. He cut and spliced the sound bites to make Schiff look like a moron in his stance on the minimum wage. Uh, do you see how he's conducting himself similar to the administration's sterilized news media? Is this becoming normative media culture in all media? Uh, I don't know that I can answer the second part. I mean, uh, my, my hunch is that it is, it is that. It, it is, that's the way the media is going. Uh, yes, I'm aware that he, he cuts and pastes interviews, which I, uh, and of course, look, he does want to get laughs and he wants to play to his audience, the studio audience and, the, and his TV audience. So uh, uh, I think it's silly to go on the show. I mean, you know, after I wrote my piece, somebody said, oh, what if you get invited on the show? And, you know, I didn't think there was any chance of that. But, num but number two, you know, let's say that happened. Uh, I don't think it would be a good place, a good forum, because he's in control. He's going for laughs and he's in the editing room, not the guest, not me, certainly uh, afterwards. And so I don't think there'd be any point to it. Uh, some people would say, oh, no, any publicity is good publicity. But I'm, I'm not con convinced of that. Uh, so I think that's a dishonorable thing to do. If you're going to have somebody like Schiff on or anybody on to to cut and paste them so that uh, you know you have the advantage later when the person can't uh, say anything, uh, do anything about it. Uh, I mean, I just think that's not cricket, and it certainly doesn't make for good social satire. That, that's not what satire is about: making a fool of someone in the cutting room. Our next question is from Ombre. Uh, Hello, Mr. Richmond. Would you say that John Stewart is a comedian locked in the grip of an ideology? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know him, so it's hard to say. I've never, I've never had any kind of conversation with him, much less one about politics. But he, see, he seems to hold, you know, the sort of the standard, what, what we think of as liberal, I don't like to use the word uh, uh, liberal in this context, but uh, it's the lingo now. I mean, it's been that way. Liberal Democrat, Democratic, uh, uh, con you know, paradigm. Uh, I assume he's in that. I don't hear him say anything uh, outside of that. And, and so... Uh, you know that's what he's out to, uh, to uh, you know teach people through through his humor and his making fun. I mean it, he's not a fundamental opponent of power, and I'm not saying he's need to, he needs to be an anarchist or you know uh, uh, a free market anarchist to, to be to be good and cutting. He he doesn't need to you know go that deep, but you know he doesn't grasp that power itself is a problem. He, he likes power if it's being used by the people he likes for the purposes he likes. I mean, uh, that's what I think comes across. Our next question comes from Darren. Uh, do you agree that non-voting only makes sense if one rejects politics and advocates replacing voting and taxation with putting government services on the market? Well, non-voting makes sense for other reasons, too. Uh, you know, Tulloch provides the the number one reason i mean why you're wasting your time for the most part look if you live in a town of you know 10 people or 25 people or 50 people the chances of a tie are much greater than in a in a much larger jurisdiction and and if uh, it, although usually the candidates don't make any difference so, so you know why even there you can make an argument that why waste your time but in any uh, significant jurisdiction and i think the average congressional district is about 300,000 people and so they're not all voters, of course, but if half of them are voters, uh, some of them are under age, uh, you know, you're still talking about the chance of a tie is, is uh, you know, minuscule and therefore uh, your staying home is not going to make any difference. I mean, I, I hadn't, hadn't voted be between 1980 and, you know, the current uh, year. And there's not, a, I guarantee there's not a single election that would have been different had I uh, gone out to the polls rather than just stayed home and slept or whatever it is I was doing, working probably. Uh, nothing would have changed. So that's a reason not to vote. And there are lots of, you know, there are many more things you could be doing that are that would be decisive, decisive in the time you would be voting, which is not going to be decisive. You know, praxeology tells us, you know, Austrian economics tells us that people act to achieve ends. So they don't usually engage in vain activities, right? If you don't flap your arms to go to the moon, uh, it's not worth the effort because you know you're not going to go. So you might as well spend your time and effort and money doing something that's that's decisive, where you're going to have a great chance of getting your objective. So uh, going to the polls is not is not one of them. So you're in a way you're wasting your time. I'm not saying there. Uh, you may come up with other reasons to vote that are, that don't involve uh, your objective of uh, 
of um, changing the outcome. You might want to vote to uh, the, for the same reason you you cheer or applaud at a baseball game. Okay, you're not going to change the outcome of the game by clapping, right? Let's say, let's say you're at a major league park with uh, you know 30,000 people or whatever the number is. Uh, but you might you'll do it anyway. It feels good. You're rooting a team, so you might like a candidate apart from libertarianism. You might like a candidate, maybe it's Ron Paul, and you just say, I, I just want to. Do I, I just want to vote for him? I want to be able to tell myself or tell my friends, ah, I voted for Ron Paul or you know whoever it may be. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that's a bad reason to vote. The the only really bad reason to vote is that um, if you think you're going to change the outcome, which you're not going to do. Uh, we could get into the whole area of uh, consent, and you know Spooner <laughs> Spooner famously said, among libertarians, famously at least said that some you can't derive, you can't uh, assume consent from the fact that people vote he was arguing against that the government is by consent and some people say well i say if you vote that's consent and he said no it's not people some people may be voting out of self-defense it's the only thing left to them right they uh, one candidate in their eyes is clearly a whole lot worse than the other so they vote against that one candidate and he says you can't derive consent from that um, so he was just explaining why people might vo vote uh, uh, and, gi and giving an explanation that doesn't involve consent. So anyway, I'm going on too long, so let's go to the next question. Our next question uh, is from Ombre J. He uh, says, you mentioned something called political transaction costs. Can you elaborate? Yeah, a great book. Uh, it didn't get the attention it should have gotten it. Uh, Charlotte Twight. Uh, is an, well, uh, I think uh, she wasn't a formal student of Bob Higgs, but Bob Higgs was on our dissertation committee uh, some years ago. And um, she wrote a book called Depend on DC, which is a very good companion volume to Crisis and Leviathan. Probably no coincidence there. So the, the, it's a great uh, uh, box set to give to uh, people for Christmas or, or some occasion. Uh, so she talked, to, you, you know what the idea of transaction costs in economics is? Transaction costs are those costs associated with, um, well, engaging in a transaction? I mean, that's pretty obvious. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to plant rose bushes in my yard and I'm going to do it myself, uh, then with respect to the planting, there's no transaction cost, right? I'm just going to do it myself. But if I'm going to hire a landscaper to do it, now there are transaction costs. I have to go out and go on Angie's List or find, find a, uh, a landscaper. I may have to engage in some effort to to see whether this is a good person, good reputation. Does he do the job? Is this a, does the price he is the price he charges a competitive? Uh, once I give him the contract, I need to oversee him. I want to make sure he's doing a good job uh, before I pay him. So that effort, which I don't have if I if I plan it myself, you see, uh, are all associated with the transaction between me and the landscaper. So those in economics are transaction costs. And sometimes transaction costs can be prohibitive. They can be so high that it's just not worth it, given my values and, and my preferences and what this particular objective is. Well, in politics, there are transaction costs as well. Uh, it would be the costs involved in uh, getting government to do what you think is right. I'm not speaking as a libertarian here, and neither is she. She's looking at it sort of conventionally now from within the, the system, within, a say, a democratic system. Uh, so th they would involve, say, the citizen wanting to make sure government does only what uh, this person wants, thinks it should do, and nothing else, and then uh, picking candidates that will carry that out. So that means like studying up on the candidates, and then monitoring the office holders once they've done it, once they're in office, to make sure they're doing what they said they were going to do. All the same, you see the parallel with the landscaper. Uh, but she, so there are already there are already inherent transaction costs. In, in that political transaction. You can't do away with them if you have government. But she points out that government can raise the transaction costs. They can make them even higher and create new ones by um, making the system very, very opaque, right? Taking all the transparency out of it uh, so that people can't see what's going on. And she has a catalog with great detail of, of, of so many ways that the government does this. I mean, again, read the read the budget. Read it. Try to read a, a typical bill. Sometime you won't even know what it does because very often the bill, a lot of the bill says amend section two a subsection b of another law altogether. 
to say the following. Well, now you got to go find the first law to see what it is it's amending. A lot of bills are written that way. You can't just read it and say, okay, here's what it does. It's clear. I either like it or I don't like it. So, and then even if you could find out what government is up to, even if you broke through the veil and saw what it was up to, there are many, many transaction costs to trying to change things, right? How much money does it take to get on the ballot? Let's say you want to run a candidate, a third party, or, you know, anything else. So that's, that's, uh, that's what she means by political transaction costs. It's a very good book, important book. I, I just uh, linked to the Amazon uh, page for that book in chat, and then I also linked to an article by Charlotte Twight uh, in The Freeman that gives a, an introduction to the idea. Uh, you know, I, during early voting here in North Carolina, there was a, a woman out in the parking lot of my condo complex handing out literature for the Democratic uh, senatorial candidate. And she said, now, ma said to me as I was walking to my car, now make sure you go out and vote. I said, uh, oh, sorry, I, I have productive things to do with my time. And she said, but voting is productive. I said, I kind of wish that it were. And then I started to get in my car. And she looked at me as if I had murdered a puppy in front of her. Yeah. It well, was... It's, amazing. I, it's, it's like you were saying to a Christian, you know, you believe in Jesus? I mean, he, didn't, he wasn't even a historical figure, much less uh, the Son of God. I mean, it's like saying that. People get... I've had people get very angry. Uh, at me <laughs> for stuff like that. It's uh, it's kind of funny in a way. But they really do react. You know, tell you know the, the I, first thing I'll say is what if, what if everybody thought that way? And Tullet's answer, of course, was well. Look, if everybody said they were going to stay home, then I'd go vote. I'd I'd be picking the winner. You know, assuming I, there was one of the candidates uh, that was worthwhile, but it would be one to nothing, and he'd win. He would win. <laughs> No, oh, the other thing I'll mention, I wonder... you, know, you know, in 1850, uh, Herbert Spencer wrote, I think, his first book, uh, Social Statics. And he, it, it's amazing how modern it's, this book sounds, because he takes up this, this charge that uh, Carlin referred to in the quote, where they say, if you didn't vote, you can't complain. And he, so he discusses this. Uh, and he says, look, they tell you, if you, di if you didn't vote, you can't complain. They, on the other, they say... If you did vote and you, and the winner and you you pick the winner, well, you can't complain. You got your person. And if you didn't, if you did vote and you lost, the, your person lost. Well, you can't complain about that either. You went in knowing the terms. You knew there was a chance you'd lose. But but also again to bring this full circle, if you didn't vote, you can't complain. So in other words, nobody's allowed to complain. And this is Spencer in 1850 making fun of this. So things don't change, right? The more things change, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The more they stay the same. That's All right, I'm going to put out a last call for questions and let people uh, know what's going on here this week at Liberty Me Live. Uh, all this week, we've been having the the Cycle Conference. It's the KC Youth Conference for Liberty and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we've had Walter Block, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, we're, we're going to have uh, Doug Casey and Alex Daly tomorrow. We've got Rick Rule on Thursday. It's been a great week, and it's going to continue to be a great week. We hope you can join us. It runs from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. during the day. And then uh, also Wednesday night, we've got uh, Cal Molinay with his show uh, Fight the Matrix. Thursday night, we've got... Uh, the continuation of Zach Slayback's series on the moral psychology of politics, which has been just fascinating. And then uh, Friday night, we've got a, we're going to have, for the second week in a row, uh, Jeffrey Hummel talking uh, about uh, the Civil War. This week's is uh, why the North should have seceded from the South. So I, I feel like that's going to be a really fun talk. And you can check out the... Uh, la the last week's talk, uh, which was on the economic impact of the Civil War, in our archives at liberty.me slash live. That was another fun time. All right, we've got several questions here uh, that have popped up. Uh, D. Frank Robinson asks, if you can't write in a, vo a vote for yourself, isn't that rigging an election? Uh, 
you know, I wondered about write-ins. Uh, do they do? Are there places where they don't allow write-ins anymore? I mean, they, I thought they, I thought they always allowed write-ins, but I haven't kept up with the election rules. Well, write-in candidates uh, don't get counted unless they've been registered in, uh, in in the state. In I think it's something like forty states. So okay. unless there's been preparation, then writing someone in is just it just doesn't work. Uh, yeah, I would think uh, if you know if you believe in democracy, it seems to me you ought to be able to on the on the election day write in anybody you want. There's an honorable, honorable American tradition of writing in Mickey Mouse, and it used to happen. Uh, I, I will confess that I voted this year. It's the first time since 1980. I voted for Ed Clark in 1980, the Libertarian candidate for president. He got uh, the. Does he still hold the record for the largest vote total? I've lost track. I think so. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, I voted, and, and I did vote for the Libertarian. As long as I was there, I voted for the Libertarian candidates. I really went to vote on the ballot questions. I wanted to vote against raising the minimum wage. <laughs> I knew that wasn't going to win. Uh, and I, and I, I tried to vote to, so that every county in Arkansas would be a, a wet county. In other words, I voted for alcohol. I figured no one Libertarian is going to attack me for voting for alcohol. That lost, too, by the way. Uh, but one of the Libertarians running for land commissioner was named... And, and this, as far as I know, is his real name. It was never discussed in the paper. I was, I was amazed. Elvis D. D. Presley, not to be confused, I guess, with Elvis A. Aaron Presley. So his middle initials there. Now, while the other libertarians got one or two percent of the vote, he got five percent. So his name was worth three or four points. <laughs> so I was bragging on Facebook that day that I had voted for Elvis Presley. And I'm sure people thought it was equivalent to voting for Mickey Mouse. But. No, those are the real Elvis Presley. Um, as uh, Lucy points out in chat here, uh, I think Gary Johnson beat uh, Clark in numbers, but not in percentage. Not um, Lucy asks, how can libertarians use humor to destroy the state instead of just, you know, ranting awkwardly and making Rhodes jokes? Uh, how can they... Uh... Libertarians need to develop senses of humor. <laughs> uh, I think humor is a very good weapon, and we should get better at that. And I know there are some, you know, there, there are people I haven't kept up, kept up with. My son Ben is constantly praising Doug Stanhope. Uh, I have not seen him. I guess I should look him up. There must be YouTube uh, videos of him, uh, and I should uh, check him out. Uh, Ben's a libertarian, and I think he says that uh, Doug's humor is libertarian, and I think that can be effective. So you know, we need to we need to uh, go at uh, the culture in all sorts of ways. I mean, uh, look how successful Rand was in in bringing so many people, at least of my generation, introducing them to libertarian ideas, even if they later moved beyond Rand and uh, and became anarchists and more, let's say, more radical. Uh, she still was the portal. And that's culture. She was writing novels. That convinced people, more people than her nonfiction. So we need people writing novels. We need people uh, writing screenplays and uh, stage plays. And But humor, stand-up humor can be very effective. How to do I, it? I, I would definitely... I don't know. <laughs> I would definitely recommend Stan Hope. He, uh, he kind of oscillates between extreme anti-authoritarian humor and extremely gross humor. Uh, so that turns off some people, but he is very, very funny and definitely has a, a strong libertarian streak. Well, I think that wraps it up for our questions. Thanks so much, Sheldon, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we'll be here next month on the third Tuesday of the month for the Future Freedom Foundation webinar. Thanks everyone for coming and take care. Thank you all. Thanks, Sheldon.